And hello everyone once again and welcome back to Introduction to the United Nations. This week we round out our discussion of Section 1 by examining the historical foundations and the form and function of the United Nations by looking at its constitution, its charter, the principles and institutions of the charter, the nature of the articles that make up the charter, and the envisioned function role and institutional foundations of what are the main bodies of the United Nations and uh, in pertaining to the association of this class with the certificate on IR languages and diplomacy, uh, we're going to be looking at a number of the articles that specify and prioritize uh, certain roles and responsibilities of some organizations over others. So, you know, I realize that the readings for this week um, might have been uh, a little bit of an overkill. Um, I know that um, at least as far as Doyle and uh, Schlesinger, um, it is um, a bit more academically jargonistic uh, than many students would like. And uh, the more legally written article by Carolyn Wilson um, is, you know, it presents material in a different way um, than normal political science, um, social science texts would. But I'm happy to say that the primary read, uh, the second chapter of uh, Minx, Carnes, and uh, Leon's The United Nations and World Politics, is a good reference base, right? And uh, identifies the, the main bodies of the United Nations and really rounds out uh, stuff that we were talking about last week and the week before um, in looking at institutional and functional legacies that the United Nations um, draws from and how um, the you know, initial conferences and ideas for reconstructing a more robust and engaged League of Nations following the Second World War um, not only builds on uh, the failures and the shortcomings of that League, um, but was basically the vocation of a handful of individuals representing a handful of great powers. And I think that the legacy of great power politics, which certainly carried itself from the 19th century into the foundation of the United Nations, is really on visible display today more prominently than any place else in the UN Security Council. And, uh, you know, at the risk of getting uh, ahead of myself here, it's interesting to note the um, uh, relationship that the General Assembly and the Security Council have with each other in that they almost seem to represent um, the closest thing to, like, say, like a bicameral parliamentary um, structure that we would normally find in um, sovereign states. I don't want to, you know, have you read too much into this, but, you know, there's this understanding that the General Assembly, uh, like the lower house of, you know, most parliaments, um, are designed to be that, you know, central gathering place for all um, individuals, you know, one representation, one vote. Um, but upper houses of parliamentary democracies um, usually tend to put certain weight and privilege on certain sectors of the country over others. And, you know, the, the five permanent members of the Security Council certainly give us um, that reason to think of this in parallel. Um, but, you know, we'll get to this, um, you know, as we go uh, methodically through uh, not just the charter, but also uh, some of the articles that the charter uses to describe um, each of these uh, tendencies. So I also just want to note, um, just before we get into it, and this is you know, specifically for students enrolled in this class, so if you're just a casual listener listening in on YouTube, um, you can kind of sit back and you know, not worry about this. But for those of you that are actually taking this class for course credit, uh, please note that the first of five reading evaluations uh, uh, is due at the end of this week on the 19th of February. And if you look at the syllabus, you'll note that there is a reading evaluation due at the end of each section. So this is the first of five opportunities that you have uh, to write something. The syllabus asks you to do at least three of these papers. Um, each of these papers are worth 10 points for a total of 30. Now, as I've mentioned repeatedly, um, you can do a fourth paper, or even if you want to do all five, uh, for extra credit, right? As much as you need in order to acquire 30 points. So for instance, 
if you decide to do the reading evaluation for this section. And I would definitely recommend that you do it. I, in fact, I recommend everybody just do, you know, do this reading evaluation to get one of the three out of the way. Um, and I want to see you know, your writing skills, your critical thinking skills, so I can um, you know, evaluate them accordingly um, and still give you enough time to fix your writing, adjust your organization, and maybe modify your, th your, you know, your critical thinking a little bit uh, to when larger assignments like the big you know, midterm paper and the final paper come up, um, you know, you're a bit more in tune of what you need to do. Um, so as the syllabus says, it is, you know, I'm asking you to provide me a five to seven page pay, uh, paper uh, responding to a series of assigned questions that I have already put up on Blackboard. I think there's three. You are to pick only one. And there's always one student in the crowd that thinks that they need to answer all three. No, you don't. Just pick one of those three. But whichever one that you choose, you need to show that you are engaging the readings as well as the lecture material. So this is um, effectively an open source paper, but I only want you to use in class materials. So no Wikipedia, no outside readings, you know, nothing else. I want you to answer the question based on the readings that are assigned for this class, as well as material that you glean from these video lectures. And you need to show your own critical thinking and analytics. So don't just simply summarize, right? Don't just simply recycle or regurgitate what someone wrote more eloquently than you a few years earlier. I want to see your opinions. I want to see your insight. And look, even if you have no idea what you're doing and you completely bomb the paper, um, it's not necessarily a failing grade because you need to accumulate 30 points within this evaluation section by the end of the semester. So even if you get like a five or even a four, well then you're, you know, you're four or five points in to getting 30. I'll leave you constructive criticism and we can always talk later on in the week on how to improve. But as I mentioned, and it's worth repeating just one more time, I think everybody should do this first paper. Um, just to get one of the three out of the way and, you know, to kind of get yourself involved a little bit more uh, in with this class beyond uh, just what we are doing in class participation. Okay, so with all of that said, right, let's jump in to the material and let's finish off uh, this first section. In examining the UN Charter, okay, which was signed at the uh, June 1945 San Francisco meeting that we talked about last week um, and came into force on October the 24th, 1945. And October the 24th is when more than a majority of those participating countries at San Francisco ratified it within their own um, you know, legal boundaries here. Um, the UN Charter you know, comes into effect effectively by the end of 1945 and is really a culmination of all of the international conferences, summits, and agreements that had uh, preceded it beforehand. So the um, elite-driven power politics um, at Dumbarton Oaks and Yalta, which, you know, sort of offers the real foundations of what the United Nations would be, um, is augmented at San Francisco with a whole bunch of other participating countries around the world that want to, you know, add some substance to what was initially billed as an organization of collective security. And when the developing world, right, uh, specifically Latin America and the Middle East, finally had their chance to weigh in their own thoughts, it was here that the idea of the United Nations, and more specifically the idea of collective security, would be expanded beyond the traditional notions of collective military security, right? So this would not be um, a globalized version of a concert of Europe, right? This would be really um, an attempt at building on some of the idealistic, if somewhat naive principles of the League of Nations a couple of decades earlier, but realizing, right, but realizing that um, harmonizing state interests within a larger framework of liberalist ideology 
um, is much more of a guarantor of collective security uh, than more realist understandings of power politics. So yes, the charter is effectively a harmonization of these two things, a harmonization of great power politics along with more inclusive understandings of collective institutionalism. And here is where, you know, assertions of the sovereign state parity, right, one state, one member, one vote, um, works within a larger framework of enlightened liberalist powers, right? So from last week's lecture, um, we talked about how um, national interest and the ability of strong states exerting their influence and power at the international level, something that has been, for the most part, um, a vocation of the school of realism, right? Strong states have the um, you know, ability to influence weaker states. This is something that we actually have learned to realize can be employed through lenses of liberalism um, as displayed by the ideas of founding the League of Nations a couple of uh, decades earlier. So, you know, in other words, in, in the most simplistic ways possible, strong states that operate along principles of liberalism, human progress, human cooperation, um, collective security through economic interdependency, democratic peace theory, and the adherence to the understanding that there are some universal principles of human rights and human well-being, if this is projected by strong states and um, defended and upheld by strong states, well then, in a way, this will eventually become kind of like the perceived and accepted um, international outlook. So, you know, one could say, yeah, I mean, realist power politics can actually be used for good if ideology, you know, steps in. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of debates as to whether or not this means that it's realism anymore, whether this is just a um, roundabout way of just expanding great powers foreign policy through the UN, um, stuff that, you know, we can talk about in a separate standalone theories of IR class or foreign policy class, you know, just run with it for the time being, um, that, you know, a larger framework of enlightened liberalist powers might be able to, you know, employ great power politics for some greater collective good. And I think that this is really on display um, when we read the preamble to the charter. And I, you know, I decided that I wanted to, you know, stick to as close to the vocabulary of the UN Charter um, in this lecture. And now that I think about it, I really should have assigned it um, as a reading uh, more than some of the other ones. And I think what I'll just retroactively do is just, you know, put it in to the syllabus reading list. And I can give you the, the link to the UN uh, webpage. Um, you know, it's pretty, you know, pretty straightforward here. Um, preambles, you know, you know that it's a preamble because it begins with the whole we the peoples type of thing, right? But take a look at the vocabulary. Take a look at the liter take a look at the words here. We the peoples of the United Nations determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind. All right, now, this is classic Wilsonian liberalism right here, right? Almost to the letter. The same type of rationale was done for the creation of the League of Nations, except that uh, in the scourge of war ruining our lives once, it's now twice. But the same rationale holds. The idea that war is going to bring us to collective destruction, we need to do something. And the best way for us to do anything is to build and define an international institution that, if nothing else, occupies the international level and uses its influence and abilities to reduce the amount of uncertainty and anarchy uh, beyond the authority of the states. So, we the peoples of the UN determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind, and to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women, and of nations large and small. Classic liberalism right there, right? Adhering to positive principles of human goodness, of human equality, and the idea that there are universal principles that need to be recognized and upheld at the international level. 
to establish conditions under which justice and respect for the obligations arising from treaties and other sources of international law can be maintained. So in this sense, there's a little bit more of a structural implementation of these lofty goals, which is the necessity of an organization like the UN to make certain that treaties and other sources of international law, which previously were really done on a state-by-state -state basis, um, and when it comes to international law, it was just kind of assumed that everybody would follow the honor system. Uh, two world wars later, and we begin to realize, now we need something a little bit more robust. We need something with a bit more um, of, a, you know, of legal enforcement in order to make member states comply to promote social progress and better standards of life in larger freedom. Again, all classic ideas and tenets of liberalism. It is a much more optimistic, it is a more positivist understanding of the world, as opposed to realism, which rightfully acknowledges, right? Rightfully acknowledges that, you know, states are self-interested actors and they pursue their actions at the international level in the pursuit of power and security, both of which are in the national interest. The problem with realism is that it tends to be very repetitive in that there's no real end in sight, right? It is constantly um, the law of nature. The state of nature is the state of war. So states will, at the absolute best, um, safeguard their power and security by just simply stockpiling enough weapons, ammunition, and nuclear weapons to, you know, make any other country insane enough to think that by triggering war they could increase their fortune, right? There's even this one idea within realism that if every country was to have nuclear weapons, there would finally be no war. Um, there's just a lot of countries in the world I just don't want to have nuclear weapons. So in this sense, liberalism says, you know, rather than arming everybody to the teeth and just thinking that peace comes through stalemate, can, let's let's like advance some principles and some ideals where we don't need to arm everyone to the teeth, but we can just make people trade. We can make people understand that, you know, people in one part of the world have the same problems and challenges and fears and anxieties as the other, right? So for these ends, to practice tolerance and live together in peace with one another as good neighbors, to unite our strength and maintain international peace and security, and to ensure by the acceptance of principles and the institution of methods that armed force shall not be used, save in the common interest, and to employ international machinery for the promotion of the economic and social advancements of all these people, but before we get to the final ta-da moment, right, the purposes here are to reduce the necessity for military action to increase right? Principles of economic cooperation and human well-being. These are the qualitative elements, right? That Latin American, Middle Eastern, other countries at San Francisco wanted to add into the charter, right? Rather than making the UN just simply a form of hardcore old school collective security, the understanding was security can be realized through interdependency, through cooperation, with all of that in mind, we have resolved to combine our efforts to accomplish these aims. Accordingly, our respective governments, through representatives assembled in the city of San Francisco, who have exhibited their full powers found to be in good and due form, have agreed to the present charter of the United Nations and do hereby establish an international organization to be known as the United Nations. So, the purpose of the UN, right? Short version is to do what the League of Nations couldn't do, but and therefore make it better. Um, longer version is that in an increasingly globalizing world that is going to be beset by an even more destructive war if the first if this if the first and second are not mitigated we need an organization like the UN that is truly global in scope to provide a forum of information uh, a platform of mediation and an opportunity for states and societies around the world to share their interests and their grievances and be able to find common ground for the purpose of collective benefit of everyone moving forward into the next you know, few years, months, and even centuries. Okay? So with that understanding, right, it is very clear that the purpose and the principle of the United Nations 
is to, number one, Article 1.1, maintain international peace and security, and to that end, take effective collective measures for the prevention and removal of threats to the peace and for the, and for the suppression of acts of aggression and other breaches of the peace, and to bring about by peaceful means and in conformity with the principles of justice and international law, adjustment or settlement of international disputes or situations which might lead to a breach of the peace. So right off the bat, we are talking about hardcore collective security, right? Peace and security and any by any means possible. Censuring states that violate peace and security and to, in order to do this, to develop friendly relations among nations based on respect for the principles of equal rights and self-determination of peoples, and to take other appropriate measures to strengthen universal peace. Point three, to achieve international cooperation in solving international problems of an economic, social, cultural, or humanitarian character, and in promoting and encouraging respect for human rights, and for fundamental freedoms for all without distinction as to race, sex, language, or religion. And finally, point four, to be a center for harmonizing the actions of nations in the attainment of these common ends. Article one, all four parts of Article one are crystal clear in their objectives. Number one, the promotion and the maintenance of collective peace. But number two, and this is where liberalism steps in, collective peace, not through coercive great power hegemony, but through, for the first time, a far more democratic, egalitarian, and collectively inclusive set of interdependent cooperatives that make states go from individual self-help entities to realizing that collective survival necessitates cooperation and to the point that increased economic, social, cultural, or humanitarian interaction reduces uncertainty between one state and the next, increases dependency on two or more states, and over time creates a narrative in which the public finds far more things in common with their counterparts in another country than differences. So Article 1 lays the philosophical foundations of the United Nations clearly within principles of 19th century liberalism. Article 2 takes this one step further by noting that all UN members shall enjoy the same degrees of sovereign equality, no matter how powerful or how weak. So every member of the UN is an internationally recognized sovereign entity. And this goes a very, very long way in, in really doing two things. One, it provides a sense of international equality for all member states, right? Ranging from the United States to Haiti, right? All have equal representation, all have the same number of delegates at the General Assembly, one voice, one vote. The other thing that it does, and this is something that we don't realize until decades later, is that it really puts the burden of sovereign legality and legitimacy on UN recognition. Now, this might not seem all that problematic if you don't consider a number of partially sovereign, unilaterally declared statelets around the world that might have some capacity of exercising self-government at home, but do not, and for the foreseeable future will not, um, have membership in the United Nations if its sovereignty is contested. So, you know, when the UN was founded, it was somewhat, um, I guess, far more obvious, right? If you're a state, you've already declared yourself as a state, you sign on to the UN Charter, congratulations, you are part of the you know, UN. Um, increasingly, and this is especially true since uh, 1990 when the Cold War ended, um, one really needs to either be diplomatically irrelevant to suddenly become a country, 
or have friends in all the, you know, five veto members of the Security Council to get you into uh, UN membership. We'll talk more about that um, as the semester progresses. But Article 1 and 2 um, is effectively cement foundations, right? Article 1 lays out the, ph the philosophical understandings, the uh, underpinnings of the UN. And Article 2 says that in order to be a member of the UN, you have to be a sovereign state. But if you are a member, you are internationally recognized as such as well. Okay? So it puts countries on the same level as other countries, far more powerful ones. But as I've mentioned, it makes it difficult for would-be countries that are struggling for independence uh, to get into the UN if there are enemies and opponents of said independence. Okay. All right, moving on here, and there are a number of articles within the Charter. Um, article 7 and 8 simply lay out the organization, things that we've already talked about last week. Article 7 um, establishes um, the function of the General Assembly, the Security Council, the Economic and Social Council, the International Court of Justice, and the Secretariat. And it really is here that I want to spend some time talking about each one. Now, you might think to yourself, why am I starting with Trusteeship Council? Why don't I go with General Assembly and just kind of go from there? Um, I like to start with the Trusteeship Council really for just one reason. Um, it's short. It doesn't really have anything to do with the UN anymore. It is, at this point, more for historical purposes. Um, so I'd rather just get it over with now than, you know, go through all the big stuff and then kind of say, oh, by the way, trusteeship. So for the purposes of just knowing that it exists and the idea that there are um, <laughs> almost 20 articles uh, that uh, identify and define this trusteeship council. It is, as we talked about last week, a coordinating body, or at least a former coordinating body, um, that organized the peaceful transition to independence of former colonial territories. Now, don't get too ahead of yourself here, because we are talking really former colonial territories of powers that lost a world war. <laughs> okay, So it's not a halfway house for soon to be former British colonies or French colonies or others like that, right? Remember the uh, the big wrangling um, at uh, Yalta that um, the Trusteeship Council, which is a direct um, bring over from the League of Nations, uh, might be seen by many uh, colonial um, interests uh, as a way of transitioning them away from, you know, some form of imperialism towards independence in order to make certain that, you know, the British and the French were on board with this, right? It was pretty clear that this will not touch current colonies, right? So the function of the Trusteeship Council, which just by its definition kind of made it obsolete from the beginning, um, is that it oversaw the administration of non-self-governing territories inherited from the League of Nations. So we are talking about a handful of territories. Uh, most of them were former German colonies in Africa and the South Pacific that were um, seized by the League um, at the end of the First World War and placed under some kind of mandate control because they were deemed unprepared for self-determination. Um, the number of territories that go into the Trusteeship Council increased at the end of the Second World War when Japanese colonies and territories were seized. But, as we talked about last week, Article 78 is very clear in stating the trusteeship system shall not apply to territories which have become members of the United Nations, relationship among which shall be based on respect for the principle of sovereign equality. This was that incident in which the Syrian and Lebanese delegates came to San Francisco on their own accord, signed the charter, and effectively by that process became founding UN members. As soon as Trusteeship Council is talked about, and as soon as the idea of colonies are mentioned here, these two now new countries, as far as the UN was concerned, get worried because they're thinking, well, are we going to go under the Trusteeship Council? We signed the UN charter. We Are we not 
equal countries. So Article 78 was put in there to ensure not just these two. And again, they were doing this because at the time France was occupied by Germany. So, you know, they're able to kind of break away, right? This will not apply to territories which have become members of the UN. So this is a very clear way in delineating that the number of entities that are part of the Trusteeship Council is small and is going to remain small. Now, I talk about this mostly in the past tense, right? Because the Trusteeship Council no longer operates. It still has a chamber within the New York UN. It looks really nice. If you go on a UN tour, you can go in there and nine times out of 10, right, the room is empty. It might be, you know, used for other purposes at this point. But the Trusteeship Council is not to be confused with a transitory body for future former colonies. This was something that might have been discussed in early meetings that colonies that, you know, major powers can no longer hold on to, you know, do they kind of go into this um, halfway house, right? Do they go from colonies to um, sovereign states through the trusteeship council? And what it, the history here is kind of vague because the, you know the British and the French were very adamant about making certain that this wasn't, but at the same time the colonies didn't really want to go into trusteeship council because the territories that are in it, like German Southwest and Southeast Africa, they they're not given independence. They're actually just simply they're they're technically international territory, but the day to day management of them is administered by British South Africa. So you basically just go from one person's colony to someone else's. And so the, you know, soon to be former colonies like India and Nigeria and others, you know, were also like, no, 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 we don't want to go into trustee because we don't know how long this is going to last. So what's interesting about this is most of these colonies go directly from colonies to independence, bypassing the trusteeship council, and like Lebanon and Syria, are given full membership, you know, almost immediately. So the trusteeship council was founded in 45, and it was already um, kind of an historic, soon-to-be obsolete body. Um, full operations were suspended on the 1st of November 1994 uh, with the independence of Palau. So as I've mentioned, it no longer functions in its original capacity today. And so people are wondering, what do we do? Do we eliminate it from the charter? Do we take it out of the thing? Um, you know, th two things are keeping it from being removed. One is um, just, you know, bureaucratic obstacles. And two is, I don't know, tradition, right? They don't want to take it out. They feel like it's one of the few things that they could say, hey, this thing worked and it's done. Isn't that nice? Some people are saying that it could serve as an organization for coordinating a number of these disputed parastates, right? These partially sovereign uh, entities that are unlikely to uh, return to host state control. So, you know, Taiwan, Kosovo, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, Abkhazia, uh, Northern Cyprus, Western Sahara, you know, whatever. Um, the thing is, is that if these territories are disputed, right, and they are, then it stands to reason that there is at least one powerful country in the world that's working to prevent it from gaining any more sovereignty. So the idea of a trusteeship is that a, you know, an international territory has membership in this council, but the caretaking authority also has membership. So where does that caretaking authority go? And if it goes into a trusteeship council, does it mean that independence is all but formally guaranteed, right? So if, you know, China wants to ensure that Taiwan does not become a country, or Serbia wants to make certain that Kosovo does not become, you know, universally recognized, my guess is that they are going to put up obstacles and barriers or, and use their, either their own veto or an allied veto in the Security Council to keep that from happening. So we've talked about, you know, what the Trusteeship Council should do for years. And, you know, as years go by, you know, the room just, you know, stays there um, for, you know, display purposes largely. All right. With that said, let's get to the real heart and soul of the UN. And Articles 9 through 12 talk about the General Assembly.
right? General Assembly, is, this is the face of the UN, the most um, visible and accessible. When people think of the UN, they think of the big grand auditorium, the big grand meeting hall, right? With the you know, huge ceilings and the, you know, the, the delegate panels that go in the semicircles. It's the, you know, it's the closest thing that we have to like a real world governing body. Um, and it is the primary arena for international dialogue and engagement. Like you want to talk about the theoretical ideas of the UN serving as a platform for communication, for meeting out grievances and overcoming differences. Um, the General Assembly is your one-stop shop. Um, the GA admits new states to membership, so if you get a spot in the General Assembly, guess what? You are an honest-to-God, bona fide international state. The most recent country to become a member of the General Assembly, and thus an internationally recognized state, was South Sudan in 2011, if I'm not mistaken. In fact, it, uh, gained, it gained independence on July 9th, and in less than a week, um, it was admitted to the United Nations. So it tells you that there was no obstacles in the Security Council for South Sudan. Um, it uh, got its independence through a referendum. The Sudanese government in Khartoum had recognized it. Um, you know, real simple stuff. Congratulations. Here's your place in the UN. You're not the strongest country in the world. In fact, you're more often than not a failed state. But hey, you know, you've got a spot in the UN because the General Assembly voted you in. The General Assembly also elects non-permanent members to the Security Council, ECOSOC, and the Trusteeship Council, although that is now, um, you know, historical. It appoints judges to the International Court of Justice, and it appoints uh, the UN Secretary General. So the General Assembly is really the primary hub of the UN. And its members are, you know, are comprised of professional diplomats and, you know, um, and delegates, but they all represent their home governments. So it really is a community of nations at the General Assembly, right? It is every delegate has its own flag, its own interest, and it is here that states use this platform to find common ground to overcome differences one, you know, would hope. Um, and while the General Assembly technically is in operation all year, um, there is a three-month annual meeting beginning every December in which everybody assembles, right? It's almost like the beginning of a new year. And, you know, delegates from every country, from, um, you know, Afghanistan all the way to Zimbabwe, um, all have their time to get up at the podium, give speeches, right? You may have heard some of them. You know, Donald Trump has done it. Barack Obama um, has done that. Um, I would imagine this coming September, Joe Biden um, will do it um, if he doesn't delegate it to someone else. And, um, you know, this is where formal dialogue and uh, informal and informal dialogue between UN ambassadors and national foreign ministers, you know, sort of take place. Um, and, you know, with that understanding, the General Assembly works in tandem with the Security Council, right? So as I mentioned in the beginning of this discussion, um, it's tempting, you know, to kind of look at the UN and note its two most visible bodies, the General Assembly and the Security Council, as kind of like the lower and upper house, respectively, of a bicameral parliament. We've got 193 members in the GA, and you have only 15 in the Security. Um, and Articles 11 and 12, I think, clearly um, design this relationship uh, between the two. So Article 11 notes that the General Assembly may, quote, consider the general principles of cooperation in the maintenance of international peace and security, including the principles of governing disarmament and the regulation of armaments, and may make recommend recommendations with regard to such principles to the members of the Security Council or to both. So the General Assembly works in close cooperation with the Security Council, alerts it to certain 
you know, elements that are specific to security. And at the same time, the Security Council is exercising in respect of any of the dispute or situation, the functions assigned to it in the present charter, the General Assembly shall not make any recommendation with regard to that dispute or situation unless the Security Council so requests. Now, what is the purpose of this? Articles 11 and 12 note the relationship, the you know, delineated relationship between the GA and the Security Council. The, but it is clear, the General Assembly, right, the community of 193 states, nations, people, whatever it is that you want to call it, can raise information to the Security Council. But it is clear that the Security Council is responsible for acting and deciding on this. And Article 12 effectively says the General Assembly cannot think and decide independently of what the Security Council is now considering unless the Security Council allows it to do so. So in so many words, once information is kicked upstairs, it is now part of upstairs to figure out, very much so um, in terms of lower houses and upper houses. So there is that relationship, right? But the General Assembly is subordinate to a body that still represents great power politics, right? That still represents a smaller group of individuals, a smaller group of states with more specifically um, delineated powers and responsibilities. So the what does the G, what does the GA then do right Article 18 uh, points out that the General Assembly votes on measures right votes on resolutions understandings whatever it's you know called with a two thirds majority in which case it is now passed on to the Security Council once again very reminiscent of a bicameral parliamentary legislature right um, so if something passes the GA. It can still be killed in the Security Council. So I go back to the issue of um, disputed territories, right, like Palestine and Kosovo. And, you know, it's kind of implied that if, let's say, if Palestine has 135, let's say roughly 135 international recognitions, then it stands to reason that a vote to include Palestine as a new member of the UN as the as the 194th country is going to pass in the general assembly right if let's say 135 vote yes against the remaining members of 193 and remember one country one vote it's going to go to the security council but we all know that it's going to die in vote in the security council because now the united states right which has one vote among 192 others is going to use its veto power to kill the whole thing likewise the same thing for kosovo for a couple a couple of years ago when kosovo was racking up recognitions um some people were saying well if it passes the um you know the half point threshold it can get membership which was wrong you need two thirds uh, but even if it does get two thirds which it never reached um russia is, and china are just going to kill it in the security council so the point to be made here is that you know as long as the security council doesn't have a problem with it yes if it passes the ga with a two-thirds majority the security council is going to vote on it and pass it right so it's like a two-part resolution here and if we continue with this allegory of the General Assembly being the equivalent of a legislative body, it's not that far-fetched to think that countries vote along coalitions. Countries vote in blocks um, according to their geography, their common economic interest. Um, they will vote according to um, you know, political realities. So during the Cold War, we saw very clearly voting blocks between the first, second, and third world. I'm sure that many of you have heard of first world countries and third world countries. Um, and I you know, always feel the need to explain this. You know, people always wonder, well, what's a second world country? Um, this is an obsolete term that no one uses anymore. The second world um, effectively was the Soviet Union and its allies during the Cold War. So much of Eastern Europe, um, the Soviet Union itself, uh, Cuba, um, you know, a couple of countries here or there, periodically in Africa or Asia. China, I think, was kind of half in, half out. You know, third world countries aren't necessarily 
poor, undeveloped, backward, you know, nothings. But third world countries, again, in the Cold War, um, designated what we call the non-aligned movement, right? The non-aligned movement, countries that were neither diplomatically or um, officially, ideologically um, aligned with either the first world, the U.S. and its allies, or the second, the Soviet Union and its. So third world was just kind of everyone else, Yugoslavia, um, Egypt, Indonesia, um, Nigeria, Ghana, um, much of South America, um, Southeast Asia, India was certainly a part of that um, as well. So voting blocks certainly are present historically. Uh, today we kind of see this north-south divide, you know, the industrialized north versus the global south. Um, again, it's um, kind of, you know, industrial versus agriculture, developed versus um, developing or undeveloped. And while voting blocks may be necessary to either advance ideas or to prevent unpopular ideas, um, more often than not, a lot of these voting blocks tend to be um, just more diplomatically rigid uh, than anything else. So sometimes countries will vote in these voting blocks uh, that might even go against their interests, but they do so um, just to be part of these, you know, coalitions. And, you know, in a way they are taking their marching orders from other regional or multilateral organizations like the African Union, the OAS, the European Union, uh, the Organization of Southeast Asian States, you know, what have you, right? They're told this is what we... Um, uh, believe this is what we <clears throat> want at the regional level. This is how you're going to vote in the General Assembly, right? Now, for most of your lives, right, and, I'm, and when I say yours, I'm talking about you students, um, the General Assembly seems increasingly rhetorical, right? It just seems like it's put there to kind of give the impression that there is uh, global equality and egalitarianism. Um, this was not always the case. The General Assembly was quite powerful and quite influential in the first few decades of the UN's existence, primarily during the Cold War. There really was this changeover around the 1990s, early 1990s. We began to see, with the end of the Cold War, the collapse of the bipolar power alignment between the United States and the Soviet Union, Voting blocks now just kind of explode, especially with the age of globalization coming in, um, and power and influence has certainly shifted away from the General Assembly to the Security Council. Um, and this may, you know, be because of new challenges and new threats to global security that, you know, cause the Security Council to meet more than they used to. But it also belies the idea, right, that um, the biggest decision-making in the world today is not done by a 193-member body, but by a 15-member body. And one-third of those 15 members um, represent the Allied victories of a war that ended almost 80 years ago and has veto power that could effectively kill any resolution, even if everyone else votes on it and this one country votes no. So it's appropriate then to segue from the General uh, Assembly to its counterpart, the Security Council, which, interestingly enough, in the original UN Charter, only comprises nine articles, right, for something that is increasingly more powerful and more influential by the year, right? The original Charter um, is pretty straightforward in what the Security Council does. So if the GA functions as the, U, as the UN's legislative body, um, the Security Council is, if not the upper house of parliament, it's almost the executive body because nothing passes in the UN today um, without the Security Council being on board. Right? I mean, that's just kind of what the realities are. Um, and even though the Security Council, according to Article 24, is meant to deal primarily with threats to international peace and security, this is a highly interpretive phase. Right? So maybe initially, right, the Security Council idea was to consider old school understandings of um, institutionalism, right? Concert of Europe, um, uh, Congress of Berlin, you know, like the big powers pool their military resources uh, together. 
But if peace and security can be expanded to include economic and social well-being, well then, even though the Security Council is still mandated to think in terms of state security, threats to regional stability, economic problems, humanitarian problems can be interpreted right, to justify intervention, to justify censoring a country, uh, can be used to justify putting sanctions on a country. Okay? So the idea of international peace and security, right, can, it, it's interpretive, but as long as you f uh, frame it within this understanding, it falls under this jurisdiction of the Security Council. Now, one of the you know, basic things here is that there are five uh, permanent and ten non-permanent members. Uh, the non-permanent members enjoy a uh, two-term uh, rotation. Um, Article 23 enumerates this. Um, and the membership was amended in 1965. Uh, there used to be six non-permanent members. Now it's been upgraded to ten. In order for a resolution at the Security Council to pass, Article 27 states that four non-permanent members must vote in favor for a resolution to pass. So even if all five of the permanent members vote yes on something, the resolution can still not pass. It can still fail. It doesn't mean that it's vetoed, right? So if the other 10 non-permanent vote no and the big five vote yes, it can still fail. Now, it's unlikely, but it's, you know, statistically uh, probable. Now, it makes it even less probable when we realize that the non-permanent members must come from a variety of areas around the world. So, you know, you can't just like uh, nominate 10 non-permanent members from Europe one time and, you know, Latin America the next. Um, five seats need to go to countries in Africa or Asia. Um, one needs to be from Eastern Europe, two from Latin America, two from Western Europe, and this designated other, which, you know, usually involves countries that you know, are not necessarily Asia, not necessarily, you know, like Israel or something like that, right? So you got to meet a quota. And that, of course, means that if they're all coming from different areas and they all have different socioeconomic and sociopolitical interests and agendas, um, it's you know unlikely you know it, it's unlikely that there's going to be um, unity in opposing something in that sense. But the other thing is that you know we can talk about what the non-permanent members can and can't do, but it's almost impossible for them to really have any functioning power when the top five have that veto power, right? And they are permanent members. So in this sense, right, we all know that even if, let's say, all 10 are in favor of some resolution, and as long as one of the five is threatening to use their veto, then as a non-permanent member, I mean, I guess you can enjoy bragging rights that you're there, that you can enjoy um, that you're part of a, you know, a more exclusive club of countries, um, you know, but if the United States just says, look, don't even bring this up, we're going to veto it, or Russia or China or something like that, um, you know, it kind of diminishes the whole idea of voting and debates and regional, you know, representation here, which, you know, brings us to kind of um, audits the Security Council. I don't want to say that it is nothing more than a prisoner of self-interested politics of the five big members. Um, it has done a number of major things for the UN. It has achieved a number of accomplishments. The Security Council has approved um, war crimes tribunals, not just for the civil wars in Yugoslavia, but also for Rwanda and Cambodia, to name two others. It authorized intervention in Bosnia on humanitarian grounds. It authorized the establishment of UN protectorates, the closest we've ever come to a trusteeship um, in Kosovo after 1999 and East Timor in the 1960s or 70s. I don't exactly remember when. The Security Council has also worked to expand and define the international legal parameters of nuclear non-proliferation. So, you know, they're not just simply authorizing or denying war. They're also working on defining what it means to think of nuclear power, nuclear weapons, nuclear threats, 
um, you know, nuclear non-proliferation. Right? So the Security Council more often than not passes resolutions than vetoes them. Right? The vetoing tends to be only for like real, real, real specific things. Um, but those specific things oftentimes make the news. So the UN failed to reach an agreement on Kosovo's final status uh, in late 2007. Uh, Kosovo did um, declare uh, unilateral independence on February 17th, 2008, but it did so outside of um, UN legality. The Russians and the Chinese um, had vetoed um, any resolution that called for Kosovo to be um, recognized as, an, as a sovereign state. Um, the same thing really happens at the opposite end uh, with the United States in trying to block um, any attempts uh, by the Palestinian territories from becoming a full internationally recognized member uh, of the United Nations. Um, Russia and the United States came to blows, um, diplomatic blows, word blows, um, over intervention in Syria. The United States wanted to intervene in Syria. Russia said absolutely not um, and vetoed that resolution. And probably the most public, uh, the most overly dramatic, and you know this, um, I have to admit, was before many of your time here, was the endless debates in the Security Council in 2002 and 2003 over intervening in Iraq uh, when George W. Bush wanted to invade over allegations of weapons of mass destruction, chemical weapons, biological weapons, UN weapons inspectors went in, they found nothing. Um, we called their bluff. We either thought that they were lying or Saddam was hiding stuff. Um, there was this attempt at, you know, getting a resolution. The United States wanted a resolution to authorize war. The French were absolutely opposed to war. This was the height of American patriotic jingoism. This was the age of Team America World Police. <laughs> this was the age of freedom fries and freedom toast, right? Um, so a resolution that was finally passed um, was passed in a way that made the terminology of penalties and consequences for non-compliance for UN weapons inspectors so blatantly vague and open-ended that, you know, the French were like, okay, it doesn't necessarily say war, so we're on board with that. And the United States, got to remember, this is, you know, George W. Bush was like, well, consequences are, you know, can include war. So, you know, the, but the idea was is that when the United States did go to war with Iraq, um, it was widely condemned by the UN, did not have specific um, UN approval for war. Um, we pointed to Resolution 1441 that said, well, non-compliance mean we intervene. The UN was like, bro, you are really interpreting this, you know, loosely here. But we went to war and, we, you know, the rest is history. All right, less controversial, but, uh, you know, entirely differently dis uh, dysfunctional uh, element of the UN is the Economic and Social Council, which uh, most people just refer to as ECOSOC. And uh, much of ECOSOC's form, function, composition, membership, uh, roles and responsibilities are uh, listed in Articles 61 through 72. ECOSOC is... ECOSOC is weird, right? ECOSOC is weird. It's also incredibly paradoxical because if the Security Council is a special unit of the UN dedicated to collective security and everything that it could be understood there, ECOSOC is kind of like its disorganized, scatterbrained, um, you know, twin brother that handles everything else, right? It's a 54-member central bureaucratic body for directing, <clears throat> addressing, and coordinating um, economic and social issues, right? And that's just laid out uh, in Article 62. Um, part of its mission is to promote higher standards of living in the world um, and identify solutions to economic, social, and health problems. Now, ECOSOC is kind of like this design-by-committee um, organization. Much of it was, you know, pondered and thought of at Dumbarton Oaks and Yalta, but, you know, whereas the initial um, ideas of the UN were um, military security first <clears throat> and everything else second, San Francisco 
uh, when it uh, when it invited everyone else around the world, and here we're talking about you know 50 some odd countries at the time, they're all coming there saying, hey, wait, listen, you know, we want things like development, we want investment, we want um, material, social, um, you know, um, industrial um, productivity and well-being. So that's the reason why it seems so cumbersome and, you know, everything else. You know, ECOSOC is kind of like the UN's junk drawer uh, in handling all sorts of issues that range from, you know, humanitarian well-being, the role of women, um, population and development, the, um, you know, the, um, the monitoring of narcotics and drugs, um, the role of science and technology in developing, um, you know, parts of the world. Uh, there's an entire subunit just devoted to forests, of all things. That's, that's not bad, you know. Um, cr you know, crime prevention and, and criminal justice. So, you know, ECOSOC is just, you know, a bureaucracy that holds smaller bureaucracies. And what makes it even more um, problematic is that ECOSOC is the UN's most um, publicly accessible um, element, right? Or at least for, from a civil society um, NGO level, right? Whereas Security Council is, you know, behind closed doors. General Assembly is you got to be a member state, right? ECOSOC, yes, it is, it is made up of member, UN member states, but it also works um, by cooperating and kind of farming out a lot of its um, responsibilities uh, to a number of international NGOs, right? And this is listed in Article uh, 63. Um, and many of these are, you know, like the Trusteeship Council, um, you know, leftover legacies from the League of Nations, right? Because nobody really decides to, like, streamline economic development uh, as much as, uh, you know, hardcore security. So, you know, ECOSOC kind of handles everything else. And, you know, if you want to get a job in the UN and you want to, you know, be part of more, um, you know, on the ground, hands-on grassroots movement around the world, um, you know, ECOSOC is definitely for you. And so that's why I kind of identify ECOSOC as the UN's most important back-end organization. It doesn't get the publicity that the Security Council or the General Assembly get. Um, if you say that you work at the UN and you say, you know, oh, where, you know, I work in ECOSOC, they're like, well, what do you do? And if you're trying to think, well, I don't know, what do I do? <laughs> yeah, I do a lot of things. I don't know if there's anything like, you know, specific. Well, congratulations, you know, you're sort of working for ECOSOC. But what is also important to note, right, is that ECOSOC does have some responsibility in furthering collective security. Um, but not from, let's say, um, a, a diplomatic or a military standpoint, but in a way of improving socioeconomic and sociopolitical well-being, right? So one could say that, um, you know, with greater investment in education, uh, with greater empowerment of women, uh, with greater environmental protection, and with um, some better handle on uh, the allocation of resources, um, areas around the world would not be plagued as they are with, um, you know, political volatility, with political extremism. The scramble for resources leads to humanitarian catastrophes, um, human migration, um, expulsion of entire communities. So, the, you know, the idea is that everybody's productive, everybody's living well. Um, you know, there's no need for regional security threats. And you know, this is, I think, even becoming more and more apparent today when we look at large parts of Africa, uh, the Middle East, um, India and the subcontinent, Southeast Asia, and we begin to you know, realize that resources, some as universal as water, is becoming, in many cases, a luxury for some people over others, right? And if this becomes more and more of an issue, and you couple that with, let's say, climate change, um, the, you know, concept, right? You, know, you have climate change, you have limited resources, you have economic, um, you know, impoverishment, high degrees of illiteracy. Um, it's just a recipe for disaster. 
So one could logically say ECOSOC is responsible for putting out the possible fire in an area before it goes to the Security Council, right? If, it, if something goes to the Security Council, it's already past the abilities of ECOSOC for dealing with it, right? So, you know, in that sense, it might be more decentralized and disorganized than its Security Council counterpart, but it's no less important. In fact, I'd even go so far as to say that ECOSOC handles the day-to-day -day, uh, needs um, of, you know, the world. So I think it could be even more important uh, than the security, especially when, you know, there's no veto at, you know, at ECOSOC. The problem is, as I've mentioned, ECOSOC is a mess, right? It is just, just grotesquely hindered uh, by its own bureaucratic, um, you know, attachment to the UN, which by itself is very slow to reform, right? So, you know, every branch of the UN has its problems, its dysfunctionality, right? The big thing with the um, Security Council is the black ball veto of five members that kind of keep the whole thing hostage. Um, as I said, ECOSOC's dysfunctionality is a whole different hot mess. Um, and it is largely because of its decentralization. Um, it is located jointly between New York and Geneva, so there's no, like, streamlined organization. It works with multiple NGOs, which is fine in terms of delegating actual work, but one department of ECOSOC works with one NGO, another one works with another, and <clears throat> oftentimes these NGOs might overlap and in some cases even oppose um, each other through different mandates and objectives. So it's kind of funny <clears throat> in the sense that, you know, one organization ends up creating different tasks and objectives for different groups, which can sometimes lead to greater <laughs> um, improductivity. So while it gets praise for its practical engagement of the world, um, it's just routinely criticized for its own institutional uh, obstacles, right? The fourth out of the five um, elements of the UN, and one that is very briefly uh, mentioned in Articles 97 to 101, is the Secretariat. Now, your readings identify the Secretariat to be more than just simply, you know, more than just the um, Secretary General. Um, the Secretariat is a huge international civil service that works internally with the UN to coordinate various bodies and promote the UN as an autonomous actor in global governance, right? That's really a big interpretation of Article 98. But the Secretariat is effectively the people who work not just for the UN, but they are the UN, right? So they're not national delegates, they're not NGOs, they are not even people specialized in working in ECOSOC or the ICJ or others. Like these are the civil servants, right? The paper pushers, the real bureaucrats at the UN, who, in getting a job with the Secretariat, right now, you know your boss is the Secretary General, but you are international in focus. <clears throat> you know, you come from a country, but you are expected to no longer hold, at least while you're at work, right, any um, national allegiance or even regional proclivity, right? You are supposed to think globally. And this is uh, mentioned very clearly in Article 100. Everyone at the Secretariat, from the Secretary General on down, must refrain from any action which might reflect on their position as international officials responsible only to the organization. In other words, you have to think globally, think internationally. And while this might seem cool for someone who is working within the middle structures of the secretariat, right? You think to yourself, well, I'm not encumbered by national loyalties or obligations. I'm not encumbered by that first UN that Roland Rich wrote about a couple of weeks ago. And I can kind of do what I want and think beyond borders and regions and think globally. Um, it gets a bit more difficult as you go higher up the food chain until you reach the UN Secretary General, which is appointed by the GA in Article 97. Um, but for someone who effectively speaks on behalf of the UN and represents the largest international governing or gov uh, governance bodies in the world today, um, 
they don't really have a lot of power. They don't really have a lot of implementation. And while they're supposed to think globally, right, they can oftentimes be persuaded uh, to, you know, be partial towards uh, some groups, you know, over others. And as your reading kind of mentions is that if, you know, one of them runs afoul of, you know, one of the five members of the Security Council, like Boutros Boutros Ghali did with the United States, um, you know, the U.S. or, you know, any power like that can work to get them removed and replace them with someone more compliant or, in America's terms, you know, useless. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the Secretary General is little more than a figurehead, right? The Secretary General probably has the most um, authority, um, credibility, outside the UN, right? Especially among the public, right? The public looks at the Secretary General as someone who has this huge responsibility to coordinate and direct this big, bloated, bureaucratic behemoth uh, towards some positive end for humanity. And so in that regard, the Secretary General um, has developed, you know, rather unique powers of diplomacy and persuasion. Um, soft power, is probably a, um, a good way of describing it. And while the Secretary General cannot get any country to do things, um, he, and I say he because we have yet to come up, we've yet to find, we have yet to appoint a female uh, Secretary General, um, he does have his image as a global leader um, to you know, get the attention of a number of NGOs, um, you know, business conglomerates, humanitarian groups. Um, so, you know, soft power, for what it's worth, does, you know, I don't know, direct or influence the conversation. It gets people to think that even if certain states don't want to comply, they're taking a big risk by, um, you know, not playing along, by, you know, being defectors. Um, and, the, and the Secretary General does have this, um, you know, does have this ability, right, of promoting these, you know, Millennium Development Goals, um, promoting the, um, the, the importance of the Paris Climate Accord, um, you know, to the point where, you know, when Donald Trump pulled us out after he became president, um, within 24 hours, Biden puts us back in. Right. Again, is it because the Paris Climate Accords are great? Well, sure. <clears throat> but it's also a way of showing that we are engaging the world again um, on a global and cooperative uh, international stage. Um, the final um, piece of the UN, and one that is only listed in four articles, is the International Court of Justice. Right? And the ICJ is meant to uphold existing international law, you know, even before uh, the UN was founded, and apply this law, or at least um, get all UN member states to adhere to this law. This is um, enumerated in Article 92. Uh, Article 94 mentions that the ICJ has the power to interpret grievances within existing international law. And while the ICJ can issue both rulings as well as advisory opinions, the effect of these rulings or opinions are somewhat debatable because the ICJ, at least philosophically, should be in a position to influence the thinking of UN member states. And yeah, I mean, there are penalties for states that don't comply with certain rulings on human rights, on genocide, on, uh, you know, whatever it is that you want to call, you know, whatever you want, you want to think of here. But at the end of the day, the decisions or the arbitrary or the advisory rulings, um, you know, they might be binding, but it still depends on voluntary compliance. Right. So, for instance, right. For, so, for instance, there's, there's two there's two ones here. Um, Nicaragua took the U.S. to the International Court of Justice in 1984 um, over a series of grievances that the United States was violating its, you know, Nicaragua's maritime borders, um, interfering in the internal politics of its country, and the ICJ ruled in favor of Nicaragua. 
right? The United States effectively was forced to comply with whatever decision was made. And what does the U.S. do? Simple. It ignores the ruling and pulls out of the ICJ in 1985, right? So, you know, if you're a powerful country, you can kind of do whatever you want. Now, if it was the other way around, if the United States took Nicaragua to court, in 84, and the ICJ ruled in favor of the U.S. against Nicaragua, well, you can, you know, bet your bottom dollar that the U.S. would take that ruling and use it to diplomatically force Nicaragua to, you know, accept the decisions. But in the other sense, right, the U.S. is like, I'm not, you know, doing this. And, you know, funny enough, the United States, which, you know, we talk and talk and talk and talk about upholding human, you know, human rights, and we talk about justifying intervention in a whole bunch of countries for humanitarian purposes. It is amazing how much we bristle <clears throat> in our own relationship to the ICJ. And whenever the, you know, whenever another country or whenever some international organization brings up the idea that, you know, the United States has committed uh, a number of crimes, both in the you know, distant past and in the recent past with, you know, whether it's Iraq or Syria or, um, you know, Vietnam or, you know, whatever it happens to be, right? The United States will immediately say, well, we're not sending any of our soldiers or people to the ICJ. We don't, we, you know, we don't have war criminals, you know, it's, uh, you know, Cambodia has war criminals. Uh, the Balkans have war criminals. You know, like, we don't. So, you know, the ICJ is there, but unfortunately, you know, this, uh, there's a good number of states that just don't take it seriously. Um, a more recent ruling, and it's less controversial, but it kind of tells you ultimately that the ICJ's um, decisions are up for interpretation. Um, back to the thing on Kosovo, when uh, it declared unilater when it unilaterally declared independence in 2008, right? Serbia, the host country, like openly opposed this. And while Kosovo did get a number of big name recognitions on the international front within the first year, um, Serbia was successful in getting enough votes to take this issue of Kosovo to the International Court of Justice for an advisory ruling, not a um, you know, legal ruling, but an advisory ruling, which already was kind of like, you know, the teeth were kind of already pulled out. And the question was, was Kosovo's unilateral declaration of independence legal or not? Right. And it was it was in hope that the ICJ, according to Serbia, would say it was illegal. It was a violation of another country's sovereignty. It happened outside of UN authority. Um, Serbia was willing to give everything but independence for it, but yet it fell prey to U.S. foreign policy and it declared independence anyway. And if it's, and if the ICJ rules that it was okay, then every other Tom, Dick, and secessionist Harry would say, me too, me too. And at the end of the day, the ICJ comes up with a very ambiguous um, adv you know, advisory ruling, and that is Kosovo's unilateral declaration of independence was not illegal. Not legal, but not illegal. And the rationale is there is nothing on the current books of international law prohibiting a territory, a political entity, from declaring independence. That's kind of interesting. But, and, you know, by that point, the Albanians in Kosovo were celebrating, the United States was celebrating, and they're like, let's go out for a drink, we won. The, you know, the ICJ is like, hang on, hang on, hang on, we're not done yet. There's nothing inherently illegal about declaring independence, but states are not obligated to recognize that independence. If you want to recognize it, go ahead. If you don't want to recognize it, that's up to you as well. So the ICJ ruling, which I don't want to say was irrelevant, but it's the type of ruling that doesn't really solve anything, right? So what it effectively did was solidify Kosovo's status as this disputed territory. So countries that didn't recognize it by that point are now under no obligation to do so. And countries that did could say, all right, well, we, you know, we recognize it as such. So what it means is that recognition is going to be divided, which ultimately prevents it from getting into the UN, right? So, you know, the International Court of Justice, which I don't want to say is, you know, it, it's certainly not useless, right? But when it comes to big things like that, 
right? The rulings can oftentimes be ambiguous, and they might be ambiguous simply to maintain the ambiguity of what the international level is, right? It's all up to states to decide whether it, whether they want to do this or not. All right, so, you know, this was um, a more in-depth look at the form and function of the United Nations by connecting it closely to um, a number of specific articles from its charter. So in the, you know, remaining few minutes that we have here, I like to, you know, to give a few takeaways on this things that we can talk about in class this week, and things that we need to keep in mind as we move into the next sections, which focus on more concrete topics. The first and most important thing to take away from this week is that the United Nations, the primary theme of the United Nations is built on and still functions within ideas of collective security, right? That was the primary theme of the UN. The, the philosophical arguments <clears throat> put down in the preamble effectively wed principles of liberalism to the ideas that this type of human interaction and interdependence can go a long way in promoting and maintaining that security, right? So collective security is interpreted through liberalist principles that consider economic interdependence and socio-political moral commonalities to be critical components. So more than great power politics of my military, my decision, the idea is collective security can and often will be maintained through cooperation and interdependence. So even though ECOSOC is just one dysfunctional hot mess, it's doing its own <laughs> in providing global peace on a day-by-day -day basis. So, you know, if you're happy that we're not at war, you know, just take some time to even tip your hat <laughs> to ECOSOC. However, it is clear that the Security Council is not only the most powerful of all of these organizations, it is designed around more specifically traditional understandings of collective military security, regulated and controlled by large powers. The five big countries that have black ball veto power, right, effectively maintain that idea that at the end of the day, right, when economics and humanitarian development fail, you still need some good old fashioned, you know, mid 19th century concert of Europe to keep all the crazies on the periphery in check, right? So compare, right? Just compare the streamlined process of the Security Council with ECOSOC. And that probably explains why the Security Council gets all of the publicity, right? Because it's far more organized. It focuses on our specific set of topics. And yeah, it's got 15 members and you don't have to wheel and deal for votes or this or that. But what you ultimately have to do is if you want a resolution in the Security Council of the past, you just got to make certain that the one permanent member that is looking at this thing a little warily is not going to veto, right? All you really need to do is that there's going to be one dissenter among one of the five right? Wine and dine them, you know, change around the wording, you know, do whatever, you know, backroom deals might be necessary uh, to get them to maybe not vote yes, but to simply abstain. You know, abstain doesn't kill the resolution. It just says, hey, I don't approve of it, but, you know, I'm not going to ruin everyone else's day, right? So, you know, compliance is a responsibility of member states, right? There's the big thing with the United Nations, but the burden of implementation rests on collective cooperation, so there is this paradoxical symbiotic relationship here, right? In the sense that the UN can say what needs to be done, um, you know, during, you know, any period. But compliance in order to get this done is the responsibility of member states, right? So you're part of this thing. You need to comply. You got to follow international law. You got to do what ECOSOC says. You got to do what the ICJ says. You got to pay your dues. You got to do this. You got to do that, blah, 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 right? But in order for the UN to actually work, in order for this thing to actually function, okay, the very countries that are told to comply um, need to collectively cooperate, right? So it's kind of a dual responsibility here that ultimately tells us that the UN is, as I've been saying for weeks now, only as good 
as the member states make it out to be. Um, a final couple of things here is that the charter I visualizes the, U, uh, the UN as a thoroughly international initiative. So one of the big um, problems, grievances, fears um, that many countries, including the United States, um, had. And remember, you know, congressional Republicans, you got to re- appease them in order to get this thing off the ground, feared that the UN would be a world government. And along that, feared that the UN would have the power to intervene in the internal affairs of its member states. And that's why, um, the, you know, Article 2, Part 7, is very clear in noting that nothing in the present charter shall authorize the United Nations to intervene in matters which are essentially within the domestic jurisdiction of any state or shall require the members to submit such to settlement under the present charter. Now, that was kind of like your little fail-safe, right? Your little uh, boilerplate statement that assuaged fears in the beginning that the UN would interfere in the internal affairs of, you know, even the United States, for instance. And, you know, I still remember, um, we're now coming up on almost 20 years since this happened, since 9-11. And um, I first started teaching um, in 2001. I was a, I was a teaching, uh, teaching assistant, a TA. And I started, you know, first day, first week, whatever, of introduction to comparative politics. And I remember this you know, vividly. This is before 9-11, so we're talking about, you know, the week just before 9-11. A student raises his hand and asks me why we are not intervening in Afghanistan, knowing how horrible the Taliban are, knowing that al-Qaeda has bases there, um, you know, they're, you know, oppressing their people, they're brutalizing their women, they blew up those uh, statues of Buddha, you know, why can't we do something? And, you know, my quick response was, well, you know, the, the sad thing is, is that in the, international, in the international world, if a country is <clears throat> screwing things up, but keeping it within their own borders, it's kind of a domestic affair, <clears throat> you know, and you could make the argument that we have to intervene for the sake of doing something. But as long as the problem doesn't cross over into another border, it's not an international issue. Um, we all kind of went our separate ways. 9-11 happened. School was canceled for the first, you know, half of that week. We all come back after 9-11 and the same student raises his hand and says, now are we going to do something? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I I think we're pretty much going to do that now. Right. But what's interesting is that this idea of non-intervention has itself evolved significantly again since 1990, right? 1990 was, I think, really a pivotal year in which the UN went from being limited in what it could do to now being just overwhelmingly pervasive. Um, Since 1990, the UN has approved a number of peacekeeping operations um, that sprang from intrastate conflicts, right? Internal matters, right? So whether it's Bosnia, or Somalia, or Iraq, or the, you know, the Kosovo territory within Serbia, um, among other places, right, UN peacekeepers are largely in places that are the result of internal problems, like there's UN peacekeepers in Cyprus, there's still UN peacekeepers in, um, in, in the Suez, if you can believe that, right, so what's funny is that the charter kind of says that we're only going to get involved when, you know, it's the classic case of Germany invades Poland, right? Iraq invades Kuwait. But most of the problems that we find today are internal, right? Usually as a result of ethnic cleansing, political extremism, um, you know, human rights violations. And here, the UN kind of uses it to justify. We go right back to the preamble of the UN and say, listen, you know, if we are based on liberalist principles of upholding human rights and improving the world so we don't get into another world war, does that justify intervening in another country? Does that justify um, the General Assembly voting on the need to intervene, kicking that to the Security Council? having that be sponsored by one of the five permanent members and getting it passed, right? Does the UN 
have the moral obligation to intervene in the name of these collective human rights, in the name of these principles of liberalism, right? Be and this is the problem with liberalism as an IR theory, in that of all of them, liberalism, realism, constructivism, Marxism, and others, liberalism might be the most optimistic and it might be the most progressive. But the problem with that is that once you decide that you are going to wear your ideology on your sleeve and you are going to say that we cannot sit back while ethnic cleansing takes place, right, never again, that obligates you to intervene everywhere. It doesn't matter whether it's Bosnia or Myanmar or Syria or Sudan or um, China, you know, you, you intervene, right? So do we have the moral obligation to intervene? Do we have the capacity to intervene everywhere? You know, um, these are things that we are going to begin to start talking about in the next section, okay? But it's important to note, right, that the UN Charter begins and ends pretty much with this idea, with these sets of, you know, languages of intervention, humanitarian relief in mind. So what does that do in terms of policy? What does that do in terms of strategy? And, you know, do big countries use the UN as a way of intervening? And then, of course, you know, is intervention meant for the greater good or for just furthering the national interest of the intervening country? These are a lot of things that I, you know, feel that we can put aside for next week. There's a lot of material that we covered this time around, and I hope that the coverage of the Charter helped you get through many of the things that were part of the readings. So I'm sorry for uploading this a little bit later than usual this week, but I wanted to get it in. I hope that you have time to, at the absolute least, listen to the video as opposed to do all the readings. Um, but let's try to, once again, have a real productive conversation like we did last week um, with the material that we just covered. So I look forward to your input and I hope to see you all very, very soon. Take care.